Here we have the sequence sine of n pi over 2, illustrated in green. And so I have two questions about this. n equals the sine of n pi over 2. First of all, how do we know that this is a bounded sequence? Why does it satisfy the definition of boundedness? Bounded because there exists a ceiling and a floor for the entire sequence, right? Every single term of the sequence can be trapped in between a ceiling and a floor. Namely, what ceiling slash floor can I use for this sequence? Yeah, we could use 1 and negative 1, which means that if I pick m to be the real number 1, then it's true that the absolute value of a n is less than or equal to 1 for all natural numbers m. Cool. So this is definitely a bounded sequence. Um, we can bound the absolute value of all the terms between plus and minus 1. OK, so then why is it not a convergent sequence? If our claim is that this is not a convergent sequence, we need to show that the blue logical assertion down here holds for this sequence. Um, what should we choose for L? This is one of the other tricky bits. Um, let's, uh, let's just, for now, and we'll see how to address this problem later, um, let's just choose L to be 0 so we can prove that this doesn't converge to 0, not convergent to 0. So how do we know that there exists some epsilon such that no matter how far out in the sequence I look, I can find a term past that point whose absolute value is greater than or equal to epsilon? How should I choose my epsilon to make sure that, that always happens? How far away from 0 or how close to 0 should we set our little strip to ensure that my sequence always busts out of that strip uh, past any point that we would try to confine it? What's an, what's an example of an epsilon we could pick? Yeah, let's try epsilon equal 0.5 for a minute. Uh, I'm going to try and draw this as accurately as I can. So if I choose epsilon 0.5, then I'm setting up this sort of blue strip in here of a radius 0.5. Try and shade it in. And the assertion is that for this value of epsilon, no matter where I set my capital N, maybe I set my capital N right here. So here's my capital Nth term. I can always find after that point some little n such that the absolute value of a n is outside of that strip. And so, for example, one of my little n's would be right here. Um, that term is outside of the blue strip. Um, and it's the case that for statement that I can make is that um, a n is always equal to negative 1, 0, or 1. And which one it is depends on the residue of these numbers modulo 4. Right? So a n is equal to positive 1 uh, whenever n is congruent to 1 mod 4. It's equal to negative 1 whenever n is congruent to 3 mod 4. And it's equal to 0 whenever n is even. So a n is always equal to one of those three values, negative 1, 0, or 1. Um, and so we can always make the argument, based on the Archimedes principle, actually, um, that however I set my n, I can always find some n greater than or equal to n such that n is congruent to 1 mod 4, for example. Right? Um, and therefore, if epsilon is equal to 0.5, we know we'll always be able to find a value of a n which is equal to 1 and therefore is outside of the strip of a radius 0.5 around 0. Um, so yeah, I'm belaboring this again because it's an opportunity for us to use these definitions in the ways that we're used to using these definitions. I think it's clear from our calculus intuition why this sequence is not a convergent sequence. Um, but from the point of view of analysis, you know, we want to go back to those definitions as often as we can. OK. So that, I hope, justifies again to ourselves that not every bounded sequence is convergent. But every convergent sequence is bounded. So the job on this activity is to figure out how to draw more arrows in this diagram. Uh, and that's going to require us to understand the remainder of these definitions as well. So let's look at the definitions of some of the other things that we're seeing on here. Um, let me start with alternating. Alternating is one that often doesn't get a formal definition. Um, but let's write one down anyway. Uh, when you first talk about alternating in calculus, 
Uh, what, what the, what's the connotation? What do alternating sequences tend to do? What alternates? Yeah, the, 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 right, it alternates, it alternates from positive to negative, right? Every term has a different sign than the term before it, right? Uh, and so that might be one way of defining what an alternating sequence is. Um, and I might codify it like this. For all natural numbers n, the nth term of the sequence and the n plus first term of the sequence have opposite <coughs> signs. And one way to say that two real numbers have opposite signs is to multiply them together. And what do I know about the product of two numbers that have opposite signs? If I multiply them together, what, what are the, what's the product going to be? If one of them is positive, the other is negative, I multiply them together? Negative. 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 Yeah, there we go. Uh, so that's, that's one way of defining what it means for a sequence to be alternating. For all natural numbers n, in other words, for all terms of the sequence, the nth term has a different sign from the n plus first term. Um, this often is given away in a formula for the sequence. So what's an example? Uh, of a sequence which is alternating. Series, the sequence, sorry, doesn't quite alternate. The prototypical example of an alternating sequence is the alternating sequence minus 1 to the n, which is just negative 1 when n is odd, positive 1 when n is even, right? Minus 1 plus 1, minus 1 plus 1, minus 1 plus 1. This is the prototype. Um, by the way, often mathematicians and math professors will try and confuse people by giving minus 1 to the n a, a kind of a fancy car. We'll also sometimes call it the cosine of n pi. Because it turns out the cosine of n pi follows exactly that same pattern. Right? If we just write that in, oops, minus 1 plus 1, minus 1 plus 1, minus 1 plus 1. So just any time you see the cosine of n pi floating around somewhere, just bear in mind the cosine of n pi is the same thing as minus 1 to the n. It just denotes that negative 1 when n is odd, and positive 1 when n is even. Uh, and so very often, it's the presence of this prototype in a formula for a sequence that kind of gives away that the sequence could be alternating. So when I think about how to create an alternating sequence, often the way that I do it is I'll just take any sequence of positive numbers, like, I don't know, maybe the sine of n over n. Desmos makes me use x1 instead of n, but so the sine of n over n, uh, that's actually not a positive sequence of positive terms. So let's make n squared. Uh, no, sine squared of x. Sine squared of n over n. So I take some sequence of positive numbers, and then I just multiply that sequence by minus 1 to the n. So that's often the, one of the ways in a formula that is sort of you know, indicative of many alternating sequences that you know, math teachers dream up. Minus 1 to the n times sine squared of n over n. That would be an alternating sequence. Um, and it's alternating because, again, we have this minus 1 to the n here, which is always plus 1, minus 1. And then what it's multiplying happens to always be positive. So that's kind of the other important part, is that just having a minus 1 to the n is not enough in a formula to always make an alternating sequence. But if the thing that it's multiplying always has a consistent sign, then we end up getting an alternating sequence after all. Okay, So that's for alternating. Um, how about monotonic? If we say that something is monotonic in calculus, what does that mean, usually? Take the word monotonic apart. Mono is one. Tonic is sort of tone or character, or we can interpret it from calculus as a direction. Right? A monotonic sequence is a sequence which only goes in one direction. Either it is always an increasing sequence, or it is always a decreasing sequence, but it can't do some of both at different points in its existence, right? So a monotonic sequence, every term is either greater than or equal to the term before it, or it's less than or equal to the term before it. Every single term um, has to be one of those two things or the other. So um, in our text, they define it as one of these four things. So any one of these four types of sequences is called monotonic. Um, 
increasing versus decreasing. Those would be the cases in which each term is either greater than, strictly greater than, or strictly less than the term before it, respectively. Or these slightly more subtle terms, non-decreasing and non-increasing, where instead of insisting on the strict inequality, we have the non-strict, greater than or equal to the term before it, less than or equal to the term before it. Um, and so any one of these four types of sequences, and every sequence will meet, every monotonic sequence has to meet one of these four criteria. And when it does, we call those types of sequences together collectively monotonic sequences. Um, let's look back. So for this sequence that we were just looking at, will you say that this is a monotonic sequence? Why not? Why is this sequence not monotonic? Again, let's make direct reference to the definition. So it can't be increasing because? The third term is less than the second term. OK. So the, I'll write that with S2 first. So S2 is greater than S3. But what else is also true? Yeah, S3 is less than S4. So when I, list, when I list the terms in order of their indices, right, S2, S3, S4, if the sequence were monotonic, I need to be able to put the same inequality symbol in between every pair of successive terms as I list them in order of their indices. Uh, so this is not a monotonic sequence, because right away, even these three terms, S2, S3, and S4, even those three having a mixed relationship of order between them is enough to throw out monotonicity for the entire sequence, right? Um, because monotonicity needs to be something that holds for all terms in the sequence, not just for a few of them, not just for a tail, although we could make a definition of something like eventually monotonic if we wanted to, in, in which case we could say that there exists a tail of the sequence which is monotonic, uh, but that's not what we're doing here. We're making definitions that apply to the entire sequence. So this sequence is not a monotonic sequence. There is de another equivalent definition of monotonic. Uh, it covers all four of the different cases that we saw, because greater than or equal to, for example, would also cover the greater than case. Um, so it's a sequence that never changes direction. Right? If it's increasing from one term to the next, then it has to be increasing from one term to the next everywhere uh, in the whole sequence. So there's monotonic. The last of these definitions is the most subtle. It also turns out to be one of the more useful and conceptually one of the most important definitions uh, in the entirety of goal number two, and that's the Cauchy property. So in this example we looked at a few minutes ago, um, we had this sequence, sine of n pi over two, it kind of was doing this oscillating thing, and we were trying to come up with a way to argue that this was not a convergent sequence. The problem, and I sort of sidestepped this problem 10 or 15 minutes ago, the problem is that the definition of convergence requires us to specify what the limit of the sequence is. If we don't know what L is going to be, we have no way of using this definition. So the definition so far that we have, the only means we have to prove that a sequence is convergent, is to somehow know in advance what the limit is. If we know in advance what the limit is, then we can prove that the sequence converges to that limit using this definition. The problem is in negating that definition, we are now left with a different problem. So as if the definition of convergence weren't tortuous enough, um, let me think of it even a little bit more broadly for a moment. We might think of the definition of a sequence being convergent as including one more clause at the beginning. There exists a capital L, which is real, such that for all epsilon greater than 0, there exists a capital N, such that for all n greater than or equal to n, the absolute value of an minus l is less than epsilon. So, the existence of this limit value is a given in the definition of convergence. So we might think of it as an existential clause at the beginning of the definition. But if I then negate that definition, what happens to that clause? How would that read in the first clause of the definition of a sequence not being convergent? There exists an L and R would become for all L. And that makes the definition of not converging even more challenging. I'm going to put the L back into the absolute value here at the end. 
That makes that definition even more challenging to work with because it begins with the universe selecting for us a random limit. And then we would have to show that the rest of this definition of convergence doesn't hold regardless of what that limit value was. That's kind of hard to do because right? we're not going to have any control over what this L value is right here. So that's the real limitation of the definition of convergence. One of the many limitations, this is maybe the most important, is that it requires us to know if we're going to use it in the affirmative, we need to know what the limit is ahead of time. If we're going to use it in the negative, we have to be OK with the universe selecting any old L for us at all. Those things are hard to work with. So what we want is we want a way of saying that a sequence converges without making reference to what its limit is, without an L. Is there a way that we can discuss the notion of the terms of a sequence not getting closer and closer, there's those words again, not getting closer and closer to L, because that requires us to know L, but instead getting closer and closer to each other as we go out towards infinity. That's the shift, the mental shift that we make when we move from talking about convergent sequences into talking about Cauchy sequences. So the definition of a sequence being a Cauchy sequence begins with the same set of clauses that the convergence definition does. Right? For all epsilon greater than 0, there exists a natural number, capital N, such that, except now, instead of just having a little n, which is greater than or equal to n, now there's a little n and a little m that are greater than little n. So we're not just picking one term past the threshold. We're picking two terms arbitrarily past the threshold. And the assertion is that any two terms that I pick past that threshold will be within an epsilon's reach of one another. So the distance between the nth term and the mth term is less than epsilon. So that's the difference. What's missing from Cauchy as uh, compared to convergent is the limit. And that's a limitation of the Cauchy definition. The Cauchy definition doesn't tell us if indeed there is a limit for the sequence, or if it did tell us that there was a limit somehow, we wouldn't know what that limit is from this definition. So that's the, that's the sense in which this is probably a weaker definition than the definition of convergence, but at least it lets us off the hook for needing to know L ahead of time. Um, not only should the successive terms be close, arbitrarily close to one another, but any two terms past my capital N threshold need to be within epsilon of one another. Um, so that's what we'll mean by Cauchy. Not that the terms are getting closer and closer to their limit, but that they're getting closer and closer to one another. So let's think about this sine of n pi over 2 sequence again. Um, is this a Cauchy sequence? So let's get the definition of Cauchy, all of its clauses, back. So the definition of Cauchy is that for all epsilon greater than 0, there exists a capital N such that for all n and m greater than or equal to n, we have the absolute value of a n minus a m is less than epsilon. So that's the affirmative definition. Uh, let's get the negative definition up here also. What would it mean for a sequence not to be Cauchy? There exists an epsilon such that for all n, we can find an n and an m greater than or equal to n such that the nth term and the mth term are greater than or equal to epsilon distance away from one another. So the question for this sequence is, which one of these two holds? Suppose I pick epsilon to be a half. Before, when we were arguing that we could show that the sequence doesn't converge to 0, we set the 1 half threshold right about here, right, with a center at 0 and with a radius of 1 half. And then that's what we ended up using right, to argue why this doesn't converge to zero. Well, the, the benefit of Cauchy is it lets us take this one half and slide it up if we need to, slide it down if we need to. We can set this one half wherever we want it in the Cauchy definition because Cauchy doesn't care what the limit is. In fact, Cauchy doesn't even guarantee for us yet that a limit exists. So we can place this little strip anywhere we want to we just have to make the argument that we can find a pair of terms 
which are more than epsilon away from one another past any point that we could set. So can we do that? Can we find an N and an M regardless of where we choose our capital N? So maybe I'll choose my capital N to be right here, just for the sake of a picture. How do I find a little N and a little M past capital N such that those two terms are more than an epsilon distance away from one another? How might I choose? What two dots might I choose to illustrate that that's going to happen? What two dots am I never going to be able to get within this purple strip, regardless of where I place that purple strip? How about a dot at the top and a dot at the bottom? This dot and this dot. Right? No matter how hard I try, no matter where I place this purple strip, I'm always going to be able to find an nth term and an mth term such that the distance between an and am for this particular example is equal to how much? What is this distance? How far apart are these two terms? Positive one, negative one? Yeah, they're two units apart. And so that's definitely going to be greater than or equal to one half. And all I need to do is choose the an, choose, so that my n gives me a positive 1 for sine of n pi over 2, so in other words, it's congruent to 1 mod 4, and choose my m so that it's congruent to 3 mod 4. And I can always make that choice, again, by the Archimedes principle. No matter how far out my capital N goes, I can always find a little n past that point, which is congruent to 1 mod 4, a little m past that point, which is congruent to 3 mod 4, and therefore, that a n and that a m are going to be two units apart, which is more than my 1 half, and therefore, this is not a Cauchy sequence. And so that allowed us to make the argument without having to know where to place my purple strip, because the argument works no matter where this purple strip is being placed, because there's no way to make the terms of this sequence always within one half unit of one another. So that's the shift that we made here. Here is our full complement of definitions. Um, we know what it means for a sequence to be Cauchy that the terms are getting arbitrarily close to one another as we go out towards the tails. We know what it means to be bounded. All of the terms in the sequence are beneath a certain floor and above a finite ceiling, a constant ceiling. Uh, monotonic means that my sequence never changes direction. Uh, whatever comparison exists between one pair of successive terms also exists between all pairs of successive terms in that sequence. And we know what it means for a sequence to be alternating. And so the question is now, among these four properties, which combination or which ones, perhaps, of them are sufficient for convergence? We know convergent implies bounded. Um, but is there a way uh, for us to also guarantee that, for example, a monotonic sequence is convergent? Or can we think of a monotonic sequence which is not convergent? Is every alternating sequence convergent? Or maybe not. Um, is every Cauchy sequence convergent? Or maybe not. Um, and another tip that I want to give on this as you're thinking about this between now and Friday is that in some cases, we may need to combine some of these properties together to get convergent. So maybe one of them is not enough. Maybe boundedness by itself is not enough to get convergence, but maybe boundedness plus something else on this list is enough to guarantee convergence. So try and think about and, and look through, read through the chapter, read through the cover sheets, read through the important theorems, um, and figure out what of these sets of implications uh, we're able to draw in. Uh, and I'm going to assign each of your groups one of those arrows um, to sort of try and come up with a great proof for uh, and to walk us through that on Friday.